You know who Robin Hood is? Uh, yeah. That Disney movie where Robin Hood's a fox? When you were little, did you think he was handsome? Are you kidding? That voice and how he didn't wear pants? Anthropomorphic characters have been a thing since the very beginning of animation. Some of the most memorable cartoon characters of all time share in this trait. Bugs Bunny, Mickey Mouse, Yogi Bear… but man… There are some cases where anthropomorphic characters just fail. There's no one quite like you in this hood. My mommy says she wishes you were dead. One movie that rides the line between good and bad is Sheep and Wolves, a film that I found by mistake on YouTube, as it was hidden under the appearance of Zootopia. Well, let's just say it wasn't Zootopia. Uh, not by a long shot. Zootopia made sense to me. It was about animals evolving, overcoming their baser instincts, and trying to form a city where predators and prey can get along. In Sheep and Wolves, it's kind of the opposite. Not for the story, but in design. Their aesthetic is more human than animal, but they act more animal than human. Sexy wolf girls who look and dance like humans, but still hunt like actual wolves. Hurry up, you knuckleheads! Honestly, the entire thing looks and feels more like a furry fanfic, which I'm pretty sure is actually the case. I have a suspicion that Sheep and Wolves was created to resonate with furries, to catch the eyes of people who like this kind of stuff. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but I truly believe that this approach to the movie harms the overall quality of the film, and is the reason why it's stuck in limbo between good and bad. Oh, hi, Moz. How are you? Hi, lobster boot vermicelli. <laughs> Before I go any further, I just want to make it abundantly clear that I'm not trying to put furries down. To be honest, with all the anther stuff that exists in the world, I'm surprised there aren't more of them. I mean, have you seen the stuff from the 90s? Speaking of anthro, let's talk about what it means and where it came from. It'll give us a better idea of what we're dealing with. The word anthropomorphic is defined by the following, described or thought of as having a human form or human attributes, or ascribing human characteristics to non-human things. And folks, we as a species have been doing this for a long time. Seriously, there's evidence of us doing this as far back as 40,000 years ago. That's right, humans have been creating fursonas since day one. You can see this in paintings, sculptures, and very much so in religion. Look at the ancient Egyptians. Their gods are just fursonas with divine powers. Zorbek, Sakmet, Soka, Salka, Reshpu. So yeah, humans have been doing this for quite some time, so it was no surprise to see it appear in the world of animation. Disney, Warner, Pixar, DreamWorks… It's a very common practice, and having an anthro character can speak volume to an audience. Animals are universal. When a character is an elephant, they're probably loud and bombastic. When a character is a fox, there's a good chance that they're clever and sly, since foxes are opportunists by nature. That means that regardless of what language you speak or where you're from, that you as a viewer can connect the dots about this character and what they're about. One of my favorite examples of this is from Disney's Robin Hood. It's the scene where Prince John first arrives with his loud procession. Take a look. What characters are playing loud instruments? Elephants and hippos. And who are the armored guards for the caravan? Rhinos. And who represents royalty? A lion! 
It says so much without having to say anything at all. That Prince John has a massive ego and he wants to show it off. That is the beauty of anthropomorphic characters. To coin a phrase, my dear counselor, rob the poor to feed the rich. <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> Now, it should be said that a character who is anthropomorphic does not have to align with the traits of the animal or thing that it represents. Also, there are plenty of anthro characters who are very poorly written. Oh yeah, let's talk about sheep and wolves. Like I said before, I found it on accident while browsing YouTube. The person who uploaded the movie made it seem like it was Zootopia. The thumbnail, the title, and seeing how many views it had made me wonder how Disney didn't take this down. That they would leave Zootopia up on YouTube. Well, it turns out that it wasn't Zootopia. Instead, it was sheep and wolves. And I decided to give it a watch. I walked away from it wondering, well, that was interesting. Not bad, not great, just, uh, hmm. But there were parts about the film that piqued my curiosity. So I decided to dig down deeper and look into the origins of the movie. The studio behind Sheep and Wolves is called Wizard Animation. They're from Russia and were founded in 2007. The first film to come from the studio was The Snow Queen in 2012. It's kind of funny because most people see this as a ripoff of Frozen, which isn't the case. But uh, <laughs> that does not stop people from making accusations. I've never seen it myself, but apparently it did well. Wizard even made a few sequels, but their first original movie was Sheep and Wolves in 2016. Some of the talent that worked on this film included Tom Felton from Harry Potter, Ruby Rose, and Jim Cummings. But something that stands out to me was the production of the film. It cost $3.4 million to make, it took five years to produce, and it went through a lot of redesigns and rewrites. According to sources, the animators for the movie wanted to do fur and wool properly and spend a lot of time studying it, which, you know, to their credit, is pretty solid. But unfortunately for them, they just barely broke even at the box office with $4.1 million. What? <laughs> the story for the movie itself is pretty simple. You got a pack of wolves who are trying to find a new leader. One of those who want the spot is Grey, our main character, but he's a major show off. And his girlfriend Crystal from Star Fox, I'm sorry, uh, I meant Bianca, leaves him because he won't take things seriously. While trying to get her back, Grey talks to this gypsy, and she magically turns him into a sheep. So Gray finds himself in this village of sheep, and he tries to find a way to turn back. Along the way, we meet annoying side characters. This weird guy who has a crush on her. This guy who likes to eat grass donuts, which somehow makes him fat. And then this guy who is paranoid as hell that the wolves are going to eat the sheep. So the wolves are getting ready to go eat the sheep, and Gray has to stop them. He does this, he learns about being a better person, and he magically turns back and all the wolves and sheep live in peace at the end. I'm more of what you'd call a listener than a talker. <laughs> in fact, ask anyone and they'll tell you Muzz. Muzz is a ram of very few words. Oh, oh, and this one time I picked... Why are you the way that you are? All in all, the movie is kind of boring, but they do some things right. The voice acting was solid, though I'm pretty sure that the person who voiced this kid sheep was also the racist kid from What's Up. All right, quit stalling. Just get on with it. Gobble me up. Perfect, China. I promise to give you some Mugu Gai Pan when we get back to the house. Hmm. The animation itself is good and has a nice flow to it. Well, uh, most of the time. And there are some character designs that do work. Take this elder sheep, for example. The large horns add to his character and make him look more cartoony and stylized. But unfortunately, he's an exception, and many of the other characters fall into Uncanny Valley. For those who don't know what that means, it's when something is trying to look or feel humanoid, but it's not quite there. And when people look at said thing, they can tell that there's something off. And let me tell you, that is a big problem in this movie. A big, dumb problem. You got it. The movie itself can't decide if it wants its characters to look more humanoid or to look like the animals they represent. This can be seen in the character's hair, their teeth, the shape of their bodies. It just doesn't work. This giant ram in particular stands out to me. 
I mean, what's going on here? He looks like a ram and the rock were combined in some unholy alchemy experiment. Big Brother Egg. Also, I'm not a fan of movies where intelligent creatures eat each other. It's like cannibalism. Now, it works in movies like Tarzan or The Jungle Book because they are portrayed as animals. But when they are humanoids who can build tanks, well, it takes me out of the movie. And that really is the main problem here. How the anthropomorphic style of the characters do more harm than good for the film. Like I said before, some of these designs work, but the majority of them do not. Sexy wolves dancing with exaggerated feminine designs. Wolves with uncanny features like human teeth. Wolves running on all four limbs to hunt, despite being bipedal creatures for the majority of the film. It just... Uh, it just doesn't work. And it's really a shame too, because you can tell that there were some talented people who worked on this movie. People who put in the time and effort to create art. Too bad it was flawed from the very start. Kind of makes me wonder what else they had planned before the redraws and the rewrites. As far as the furry stuff goes, I do believe that some people who worked on this film knew what they were doing. I mean, come on. Come on. They made and designed anthro characters that fall into that category. Make them handsome. Make them cute. Make them sexy. And it's not like all of them are absolute trash. But when you go in this humanoid direction, you're gonna have to deal with the uncanny valley. Yeah. What's wrong with your face? Take Zootopia, for example, one of my favorite movies ever made. In this film, they made their characters walk and talk like humans, but look like animals. Judy has her bunny ears, her bunny nose. She even runs on all fours like a bunny at times. This was a good choice for the overall style and feel of the movie. They did not combine human physical traits into their characters. You don't see a fox with human teeth, or a bunny with human legs, or a sexy tiger dancing on stage, shaking his ass. I won't give up, no, I won't give what I'm trying to say is that this anthro approach worked for Zootopia, but it did not work for sheep and wolves. I would have much preferred if they were just animals. Wolves as wolves, sheep as sheep. That way we don't have to deal with the uncanny valley as much. Blah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Overall, Sheep and Wolves is not a terrible movie. It just makes me sad to see so much potential ultimately go to waste. And there's a sequel on the way, so I guess the studio does not want to change their course. As far as the anthro and furry stuff goes, I think it's a cool style when done right. I've already mentioned that there's power in that approach and how you can explain the character by their design alone, but it has to be done right. For Sheep and Wolves, it just hurts the overall flow of the movie, both in story and design. But Saber, are you saying that studios shouldn't hire furry artists? The law requires that I answer no. But really, there's nothing wrong with being a furry. I mean, I'm sure there's plenty of anthro characters that mainstream audiences love of who came from furry artists. Not all of them, but I'm sure that some of them are. But furry or not, when you make anthro characters, just be aware of what you're getting yourself into, cause it can be a hell of a challenge. Maybe the sequel for Sheep and Wolves can cross that bridge. <sighs> or not. Hey guys, thanks for watching the video. If you liked it, give it a like and sub for more future videos. Also, a shout out to all of my supporters on Patreon. If you want to support my content, go hit up the link in the description. All right, thanks again for watching and I'll see you guys next time.